absolutely. I know we are in the Silburn Arboretum, you know, but we're going to have some good times this afternoon because this is a celebration and it's a fun occasion. It's a precursor to Father's Day and the fathers are going to be recognized today and we are so grateful to be a part of it. Once again, good afternoon. My name is Harold Pompey. I'm from Heaven 600 WCAO Radio. And I thought it not robbery that Marva Williams would invite me and ask me, would I come and be a part of this celebration this afternoon? And I am so grateful to be here. We have so many honorees that we want to recognize this afternoon. And for the sake of expediency, we're going to get to our lunch and we're going to have the caterers come. And uh, but right now, I would like to, if I may, bring up uh, Augustus, Augustus to uh, give us an invocation and to bless our meal for this, this afternoon. And before that, may I recognize the warrior of our city, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Most eternal wise God, we beseech you even now. We call upon you today to say thanks. Thank you for the patriarchs whom we celebrate today. We, we thank you for the spirit of community that runs through their veins. And we thank you, Lord, Lord, for the spirit of service that they've all shown within their own respective neighborhoods. And now we thank you for the food we are about to receive. May it be a testament to the nurturing we all receive from you. Now bless us, and we shall be blessed. Allow the love of who you are to touch, embrace, and empower us for the rest of our day. It's in your name that we pray, and as one say, Amen. Amen. It's always good to follow something like that with good bread, good meat, good Lord, let's eat. And again, my name is Harold Pompey. I'm from Heaven 600, and I'm on in the morning with Reverend Lee Michaels, and we do a, a, a duo show, and I'm usually the comedic end of it, even though for many, many years um, uh, that I worked in, have been in broadcasting. This is my 39th year in broadcast, so next year is the big four oh years for me. 17 of those, thank you. It's truly been a blessing. God has been good. When he gives you something to do, he'll give it to, for you to do for ad infinitum, for a long, long time. You know, but uh, for the 17 years that I worked for WWIN Radio, Magic 95.9, that's where a lot of things, uh, I had a chance to cut teeth with a lot of things and a lot of things with the Fair City. And I've been fortunate enough to have um, been able to do things with the city and for the city, and I am ever so grateful that I can still be remembered that they can call me back on occasion and I can participate in functions like this one. And this is a very special day. Baltimore's top neighborhood dads of 2012. And what's really significant about this is that we, when we hear the word dad, we always equate it just with someone's by being the biological, even an, an adoptive parent. But the dads that we are honoring today are not just the biological dads or even the adoptive dads, but they have the dad attitude and spirit that's needed in order to keep our neighborhoods and our communities alive. You know, the phrase, a very old phrase, was recoined some years ago and said that it takes a village to raise a child, but that village also should have some leadership. And the gentlemen that we are honoring today have been leaders in their communities for quite some time, and we thought it very, very fitting to recognize them. But to give an, a greater uh, in, in, insightful look into why we're doing this, this was really one of the pet projects of, of uh, Her Honor, our mayor, and when she started this some years ago, and, and she has continued this, and this has really been a highlight for many, many citizens in the city as well as the community organizations. So without further ado, and for the sake of all expediency, I'd like to introduce to you 
the mayor of our great city of Baltimore, the Honorable Stephanie Rawlings Blake. Yeah. Let's give another hand to Mr. Harold Pompey. I said, we wanted you here for The Voice. We didn't know you were going to be funny, too. <laughs> so I want to thank my colleagues in uh, government for being here with us today to celebrate, again, Baltimore's top neighborhood dads. I want to thank Delegate Mary Washington uh, for being here. I also want to thank the councilwoman for this district, Councilwoman Sharon Green Middleton. I know you had to travel a long way, oh, yeah. right across the fence to get over here. <laughs> but thank you for making the trip to support us today. And I want to thank all of the dads and the supporters of the, uh, our honorees today for being here. You have been invited here today because of your proven dedication to your family and your community. With the example each of you set in your community, we are making Baltimore better, safer, and stronger every single day. And it's an honor to host this annual celebration that ensures that your hard work does not go without being noticed. Uh, as you may know, we, we also have a Top Moms event that we held last month. And each year, I'm inspired, inspired uh, by the stories that I hear. Now, I get excited uh, to, to uh, celebrate st uh, strong men in our community. I think when you're raised by a strong man, when you see um, men doing what men are supposed to do in communities growing up, you realize that, you know, you, you realize how blessed and lucky you are. I realize that. And I know that, you know, I can't take it for granted because while you're here, not everyone is stepping up to the plate. Not everyone is doing uh, what they need to be doing. And not everyone knows what they need to do. I was blessed to be raised by a dad who, and, and you know, uncles and you know, people in the community uh, that exemplified what it means to be a neighborhood dad every single day. But we all know that throughout our city and around the country there, there are men and, and women that don't have the first example of what they, what they should be in life. And that's why what we're doing today is so, so very important. Uh, because we need to hold you up, put you up on a pedestal, hoist you up on our shoulders, run you around town so we can say this is what it means. If you had any confusion about what it means uh, to be a member of your community, to be dedicated to your community, if you needed to know, you know, when everybody says, what can I do to help? You know how that is. You know, those are people that say, please don't answer, right? <laughs> please don't get, the ones that are asking, because you're not asking, you're doing every single day, and we're here to say thank you for that, to celebrate you, to let you know that while you may think that nobody is noticing uh, all of your hard work, uh, we are and your community is. So we are celebrating you today and are encouraging and hopefully uh, inspiring others to pick up the baton and do what you are doing in your communities. And as a token of our appreciation to your dedication and your loyalty to your uh, community, you will get a little something today. I hope you enjoy it. And, um, oh, wait a minute. You'll, you'll get a little something, a little certificate, a little gift. I hope you enjoy. Hope we don't see them on eBay later, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you don't like them. But I do want to say thank you to the Department of Recreation and Parks for uh, the use of this wonderful facility. Isn't this a beautiful place? <laughs> To me, one of the great things about Baltimore is, you know, they say that Maryland is uh, America in miniature, but really it's Baltimore. You know, we have, if you look out here, you couldn't tell where you are. You know, what, where in the country. Uh, you certainly wouldn't think that you're smack in the, the middle of a city. And we have this, you know, we have downtown. If you, I say, if you, it doesn't matter what you want, you can find it in Baltimore. And you know, so I'm really pleased that we're here in this beautiful facility. It is available for wedding receptions, bat mitzvahs, uh, baby showers. What else can we do here? Anything else? Yeah, quinceañeros. Let's work that out. It's perfect. But yeah, anything. So I hope that this is not your last time at this facility. And I also want to thank Black Tie Caterers for today's terrific lunch. One thing I, I appreciate, you know, you all, 
I think everybody appreciates good food, uh, but even more than that, I appreciate professional and good service. So thank you very much. You always go above and beyond, and I really appreciate that, having the opportunity to work with you again. And last but not least, I want to thank our speaker for today, Dr. Samuel Ross, who's going to give us, yes, <laughs> Chief Executive Officer of Bon Secours uh, Baltimore Health System. Thank you for accepting the invitation. I hope you have some inspiring words for the men of our city. I'm putting you on the spot. <laughs> no, we're, we're all looking forward to hearing from you. And thank you again uh, for the work that you do in some of our most vulnerable communities. Uh, your, your professionalism, your dedication to excellence is give, giving us all a good name. So thank you for that. I want to thank everyone that worked very hard to make this event possible. I want to thank the members of my staff. Wave your hand if you work on my staff. Yes. <laughs> Every year they work to make this bigger and better and uh, you know, I'm very proud of the work that all of my team does, making sure uh, that we are recognizing our unsung heroes in our community. I don't have any illusion uh, that, the, the, that all of the good things that happen in our city is done because of me. I know it's because of uh, people, uh, men and women, but we're here for the men, uh, that work so hard in the community. So I just want to thank them uh, for making our top neighborhood dads uh, feel as special as they deserve to be on this day. So thank you again, and I am looking forward to standing with you as we celebrate top, uh, Baltimore's top neighborhood dads. Thank you again. Thank you, Madam Mayor. And um, if anything that I can say, if I can even go so far as to say that, is that um, of all of the, uh, the, the women and lady mayors that are throughout the United States, I'm quite sure we have the prettiest one. <laughs> probably, a, probably in government. I mean, Angela Merkel is the chancellor of Germany, but <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, um, I um, would also like to, to thank um, the Black Tie Caterers once again, and I've been asked to, to tell you that dessert has been placed on the back table. And so uh, at your leisure, you may go back and, um, and retrieve some dessert for yourselves. And I'm quite sure that you will probably wait until after the keynote speaker has done his due diligence. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce to you the Chief Executive Officer of Bon Secours Baltimore Health System. And I know the reason why things are quiet down there because he's a Texan. So we got a cowboy down on, on Baltimore Street, Baltimore and Pulaski. But we, 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 we're working on it, okay. But once again, the Chief Executive Officer from, Bal from Bon Secours Baltimore Health System, Dr. Samuel L. Ross. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. There's a phenomenon uh, medical. It's called splanchnic pooling. Anybody heard of that? Well, that's what happens. Let's see. What time did they serve? <laughs> Usually about 30 to 45 minutes after the meal. Well, we part, it else. part of the digestive <laughs> process. <laughs> To aid your digestion, the blood goes into that splanchnic area. That's the splanchnic pooling. So I think I got about maybe 10 minutes before y'all start dozing off. <laughs> but again, I'm thankful for the opportunity to, uh, to speak to y'all for a few minutes this afternoon. I've uh, been in Baltimore about six years. It'll be six years in August. And uh, did uh, relocate from Dallas, Texas. And the guys back there give me a hard time about it being a cowboy fan, but that's okay. <clears throat> uh, thank the mayor again. Uh, thank the staff, everyone who's here, helping these men to celebrate. I want to thank the wives and other uh, partners that are here to help them celebrate as well, because we know that without your support, they couldn't do what they do. So give yourself a You know, the lady said, that's right, before the man can say it. 
So I'm also the son of a Baptist preacher, so I'm gonna make three points. And then I'm gonna pass the collection plate. <laughs> and we'll be out of here. But I do wanna talk about three things uh, as it relates to those being celebrated today. One is servant leadership. The second is uh, the social determinants of health. And then third and last, I'll talk about health screening. So the three S's, servant leadership, social determinants, and screening. There's a body of literature by a gentleman by the name of Robert Greenleaf that talks about uh, servant leaders. <clears throat> and uh, as I read the, the, the bios of each of the gentlemen being celebrated here today, uh, that's the theme that came into, into my head as I was thinking about what I would say today because you all are servant leaders. And what he says about that, the great leader is first experienced as a servant to others. And that this simple fact is central to his greatness. True leadership emerges from those whose primary motivation is a deep desire to help others. And when I read every initiative that each of you has been involved in, that's been the, the driving force. Who is a servant leader? A servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve, to serve first. And then there's a conscious choice following that to aspire to lead. The difference manifests itself in the care taken by the servant. <clears throat> first to make sure that other people's highest priority needs are being served. Again, which is what you have been doing for your community. And here's the best test of a servant leader. Do those served grow as persons? Do they, while being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants because of your example? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? And you think about what you do. And then just one last comment about the, the definition. It's not a quick fix approach. And look at the years that many of you have been doing what you do. And that's a perfect example of it. You work to remove barriers and obstacles. You focus on personal and professional growth. And you embrace people building and development. Now, like David Letterman, there's a top 10 characteristics of a servant leader. One is that you listen. And not just listen just to the words that are being saying, but you're a little bit of a mind reader because you have to do some assessment of what's the inner thought that someone has when they're bringing something to you. You know, what's behind the first thing that they might say and how do I interpret that more effectively? So first is listening. Second is empathy. You assume good intentions of those that you work around, those that you work with. Number three is that you exhibit healing. The opportunity to help make whole those with whom you come in contact with. <clears throat> Number four is awareness. And awareness in a, in a, in a uh, context that you view most situations from a more integrated, holistic position. It also makes you a disturber and an awakener. So because of your awareness, you don't just want to see it for yourself, but you want to, you want to trouble the waters. And some of y'all I've seen do that. So, <laughs> so you're, ably, you're able to sharply awake and reasonably disturb. The fifth is your powers of persuasion, convincing rather than coercion, effective at building consensus within groups. Number six is a concept called conceptualization. <clears throat> and you can translate that as you have a vision. You're able to take what you're seeing and think beyond the day-to-day -day realities. And what does it mean in a bigger context? Number seven is you have foresight. Understand the lessons from the past, the realities of the present, and the likely consequence of a decision for the future. Number eight is the concept of stewardship a commitment to serving the needs of others, <clears throat> but not just for today, but preserving what you're doing for someone for the future. And whether that's your kids, your own kids, your families, your neighbors, et cetera, 
but a stewardship not just of current resources, but really for future resource, resources as well. Number nine is the commitment to the growth of people, deeply committed personal interest in those that you work with, encouraging worker involvement in everything, including decision making. And 10, last but not least, it's about building community. Building community among those who work with you and around you. And there's a concept called community responsive. And, and as I read each of your bios, I thought about that as well. And the definition of uh, community responsive is caring for the health of the people beyond the traditional approaches. So the works that you do, many would see as non-traditional, but it's effective nonetheless. So that, that's servant leadership and really how I would see each of you having those characteristics defined uh, in the work that you do. <clears throat> and as I thought about servant leadership, the next concept I wanted to talk about was uh, really the social determinants of health. Now, there's a, a, a body of literature around social determinants of health and premature death, which is what, what would cause you to die sooner than you might normally predict. And if you look at a pie chart that's got 100%, Okay, 30% of that contribution to premature death is your genetic predisposition, which means your parents. Now, how many of you chose your parents? Nobody. So 30% is out of your control, right off the bat. 10% uh, is your access to health care. And that gets to whether you have insurance, whether you can see your doctor, et cetera. So that, that adds up to 40%. So 60% really relates to the work that you're doing in the community, which gets to the social circumstances of your community, the environmental exposures in your community, and the behavioral patterns in your community. And that gets to, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you do drugs? Do you drive recklessly? <clears throat> so the social determinants really are those things that I see you impacting in your work. Because you can't impact who the, who, who the individual's parents are, and for the most part, unless you uh, support them getting education, a job, access to insurance, you're really not impacting the medical uh, healthcare piece as much. But you are impacting that other 60%, which is critical to healthy communities. And, I, and I've heard the mayor talking about her vision for you know, 10,000 families in the next 10 years. Well, those are gonna be the reasons that those families come here. The work that you're doing that helps to make our communities healthier is gonna be part of that attraction for why somebody wants to come to this lovely city of Baltimore. So that's the connection. As a servant leader, you're building healthier communities and you're doing it by impacting the social determinants of health. Now, the third piece I wanna talk about is screening because then this gets down to the personal level, which is what are you doing to make sure you're going to be around here a long time to see this through. And it gets to how do you take care of yourself? Men on average live seven years less than women. And you can think about all the reasons why that might be, but, it, but it's a fact. <laughs> At the end of the day, men live seven years less than women. And it's another fact that most of us men don't go to the doctor unless a woman is taking us, sending us, and when we're babies, carrying us to those appointments. So we're a little hard-headed at times because for the most part, we think we got it. I see some people looking at each other. For the most part, <laughs> you think we, we're strong, you know? We don't want to show weakness, you know? Got a little ache, got a little pain, but you know, we're gonna keep going. And we, hide, we tend to hide those things from our loved ones because we're afraid they might send us to the doctor. <laughs> but don't be afraid. The leading cause of death for us is heart disease. And again, it's because we don't take good care of ourselves, we don't pay attention to our blood pressure, to those other things. And if you look at heart disease, cancer, stroke, diabetes, that accounts for about 60% of all the reasons that, that we die, and particularly die of premature death. Now, we all have risk factors that we can address. Now, family history is a risk factor, but again, you don't control your family history. But you do control your exercise, your ability to exercise. Uh, do you even walk you know, 30 minutes a day? 
and it used to be the idea that everybody thought I had to join uh, membership to a gym. And I, I had a lot of friends that had, back in the day, they used to make you do those two-year memberships. I had a lot of friends that paid for two years and never went to the gym because once they got, once they got that contract, they had to continue to pay it. But just as simple as walking. I also, I also had another friend uh, that I went to medical school with, and he used to say, he said, well, I said, are you exercising? He said, you know, here's how I handle exercise. He said, every time I get the urge to exercise, I sit down until it goes away. <laughs> and some of y'all might be practicing that too, but <laughs> that, that's not exercise. <laughs> Another risk factor is your diet. You know, I think for the most part, Mr. Pompey was asking me, was this a healthy meal? You know, we were, we were on the verge <laughs> of a healthy meal. You ate all that bread and <laughs> you ate them taters. <laughs> and if y'all go back to that dessert table, <laughs> this is gonna become a little suspect, but you know, we, we all struggle with that, I promise you. <clears throat> uh, alcohol, you know, again, we control alcohol consumption. And, and a little bit of alcohol, you know, it's not, it's not bad. You know, um, I grew up Baptist, and uh, they used to make you believe that you couldn't touch no alcohol. <laughs> but if you actually went to somebody's house, you saw that what they were telling you, what they had at home, was something different. <laughs> so, uh, I think I think there's been many a preacher. My, my, <laughs> my preacher back home, he used to say, "I go visit some of y'all, and I and I ask you for a glass of water." He said, "And I try to follow you to the kitchen, and you just..." Go into a panic. No, oh no, that's all right. Keep your seat. Keep your seat. And uh, he said, I believe y'all got some of that grand prize soda water in there that you don't want me to see. So alcohol and, and tobacco, you know, there's still too much smoking that, that goes on. You know, even though there are lots of ads and you know, pictures and all kinds of things that deter us, <clears throat> but there's still too many people that are smoking. So at the end of the day, there are a number of things that are risk factors that are within our control that are about our specific uh, social determinant of health. And then it expands to the community, and then expands to the city and the state and this nation as a whole. <clears throat> so I would encourage you to, to do those things that you can impact. And, and the other one I'll talk about is screening, because you have access to screening. There are a lot of free screenings for men that we tend not to take, a, take our uh, advantage of. Your, your uh, blood pressure screening, you know, your vision screening, dental screening, you should have uh, cholesterol, diabetes, you know, prostate, people tend to not want to do prostate screening, uh, you know, because they feel violated to do prostate screening, but, but you think about the alternative, you know, you can be violated for a few seconds or, or you can progress toward that. Now, there is some controversy right now about the PSA test, you might have heard that recently. There's debate, and all I would say to that is talk to your doctor. <clears throat> because if you've got risk factors and family history, and particularly if you're an African-American man where we have a higher incidence of prostate cancer, you know, talk to your doctor, talk to your family, and decide for yourself at the end of the day what you want to do about that. And then even uh, we should be doing uh, breast self-exam. Men should be doing breast self-exam because men do get breast cancer. It does happen to men. I, I have a couple of friends that I know that got breast cancer. And on TV, they talk, they have a, a Richard Roundtree, the actor, uh, talks about having been diagnosed with breast cancer. So <clears throat> we, can, we can have that, and we have the ability to impact these outcomes. So please do those things that are within your control uh, to make these outcomes different. And everybody has to have, I'm going to end with this, everybody has to have a different motivation. Because motivation comes from within. What's going to make you do it? You think about your family. Uh, you got a daughter you want to, you know, make sure you see through graduation and marriage, um, you know, grandkids, et cetera. But I had a patient one time that was diabetic, <clears throat> and I uh, wanted him to eat right, which he wouldn't do. You know, wanted him to exercise, which he wouldn't do. And uh, he was on oral medications, but his blood sugar was out of control. And I was saying to him, you're at a point where I'm going to have to put you on insulin. And so uh, that was our last conversation. So in, in Dallas, about once a year, we have an ice storm. We, kinda, we don't get a lot of snow, but we always have this ice storm that lasts about a day and, and quickly goes away. So I had made it to the office, and I had made rounds that day. 
<clears throat> and I got a call from the answering service. And um, I called the patient back, and it was this gentleman. And he said, I have to see you today. And I said, uh, the streets are iced up. And he said, Doc, I got to see you today by my diabetes. So I'm like, I said, okay, I said, I want to be at the office. If you can make it, I will see you. So sure enough, in about an hour, he showed up. And I was still puzzled by what was his motivation for getting to the doctor's office in an ice storm where he could have had a wreck and been in worse condition. But when he finally got in there, and none of my staff made it in. I was the only one that made it in that day. So and it was just the two of us. And I said, what is, what is the emergency? He said, Doc, this diabetes is messing with my nature. <laughs> And that became his motivation because after that, I'm serious, he became a model patient. He followed his diet, he took his medication, he did not end up on insulin. And, you know, when I left Dallas, he was still following instructions and doing that. <laughs> Dr. Ross, thank you so much. Once again, let's hear it for Dr. Ross. I think most men would probably concur that that would be the source of motivation. It would motivate me, you know. The other thing that he mentioned was basically how we, um, we have so many things to look forward to. One of the things that I've been blessed with is to have um, not only three children, but five grandchildren. And, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, I've been, been in constant struggle with my son because he's trying to reorient himself to certain things. 31 years old. And he's like, well, Dad, you know, I, I have three children that I'm, uh, I have to make Christmas for and buy things for and, and help take care of support. I said, so do I. I have three grown children that I have to buy things for. And, Make, make Christmas for and support and help them out. I said, so now you still are you know, getting a, a better understanding of what I'm dealing with, you know? And one of the other things that I deal with is stress. And Dr. Ross, you would say that stress probably is, uh, plays a very important part, is a major factor, and it impacts our health a certain way. One of the ways that it impacted me recently is with alopecia. My hair's falling out. Okay, go on. Absolutely. See, I know, I know that you're a caring man because you're under a lot of stress. You know, and I had to tell my son, I said, this was you, this was your older sister, this was your younger sister, and the rest was your mom. But I was grateful anyway, you know, because God has blessed me with a wonderful family. So there are things that, of course, that we as fathers Sometimes because of our male egos and our pride, there are things that sometimes we have to, ladies, you have to lead us. Because sometimes we are clueless. But we love you anyway. And it's that love for family and for community that is being expressed and acknowledged today. So if I may, I would like to um, begin the ceremonies this afternoon with our honorees to be addressed. And there are some names that I'm familiar with on this list that I am so happy to be a part of it. First General, of course, was nominated by the old Goucher College Business Alliance because he's committed to improving the neighborhood of Old Goucher and to make it a destination for people to come and shop. He's credited with restoring life back into the Alliance and now monthly meetings are being held with community groups, city agencies, and business resources. This gentleman also is working to increase curb appeal to the community with flowers and trees and Old Goucher signage on street corners. His vision led to the Old Goucher Vision Plan, a full color printed brochure which shows the present and future of the community. This man is called up and coming, called an up and coming superstar in the, in the neighborhood and they say that he puts in more energy into the community than most people put into their entire family. Our first honoree this afternoon, would you please welcome Mr. Ken Abrams. Our next honoree has been a resident of the Hillen community for 36 years, where he has done so much for his church and community. 
He helped with clothing drives and was instrumental in receiving aid and clothing to community residents, families whose home was totally gutted in a massive fire. This volunteer volunteers with Community Pride Initiative and they walk through the, through the community and neighborhood to identify properties in need of repair. And he was a housing inspector for 40 years, so he knows what he's doing. Our next honoree, would you please welcome Mr. Leon Bailey. This gentleman represents Langston Hughes, Lucille Park. Neighbor says that he's fun-loving, a cheerful man who always has something positive to say to the elderly, teenagers, and even young children. And he helps his neighbors rake up leaves, shovel snow, and mow their lawns. Now that's the work that really goes on in the community. No job is too small for his generosity, and he never accepts money for what he does. It's all from his heart. Neighbors say that they are so happy that Kent Bates lives in their community. Mr. Kent Bates. Our next honoree is a coach of youth sports. He teaches Sunday school and serves as the chairman of the Education Advocacy Committee for the Downtown Baltimore Family Alliance. That's a long name. And he is a very busy man, but he knows how to balance time between his family, his port networks, internet service providing service, and provided for the business in his Fells Point community. Would you please welcome Mr. Hugh Bethel. <laughs> Our next honoree is nominated by the Winchester Improvement Association because he didn't give up on his community, though many others had given up. From 9 a.m. till 2 p.m., he conducts community service, which includes cleaning the streets and vacant houses, cutting grass and cleaning city lots. During the summer, he sits on his front steps and reads to the children in the, in the neighborhood. His dedication and love for his community have made this community a very nice place to live again. Our next honoree, Mr. Theron Black. Our next honoree is loved and adored by his community and the Fayette Street Outreach Organization. He has a big heart and for others, and he's always willing to and ready to give a helping hand. He is called a good friend, and he'll give his right hand to help, help out. Last year, when residents of this community lost their power during the storm, he went right out and checked on elderly neighbors first. Would you please welcome Mr. Timothy Bridges. <laughs> Our next honoree is truly a man of the community. He has been one of the driving forces for the change in the Wayland community. He was the project manager for the Wayland Senior Village, a new senior living facility in the Forest Park Garrison community. You'll find him at neighborhood association and block meetings, working with the church to develop and implement community outreach projects. Would you please welcome Mr. Lawrence Campbell. Our next honoree takes great pride in the work that he does in the resident advisory board with the Housing Authority of Baltimore City. He is deeply concerned about the quality of life of senior citizens in his neighborhood and strives to make sure they feel secure and safe in their homes. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome Mr. Ronald Colborn. Ron's not here. And accepting on behalf of Mr. Colborn? Keith Brockington. Keith Brockington. All right. <laughs> Our next honoree is from the New South Clifton Park Community Association. He was nominated for all that he does in his community and where he has lived for 20 years. He donates so much of his time mentoring youth in the community and is a volunteer football coach. He mentors players and young men in the neighborhood and the proud father of six, he's really busy, has really raised a total of 11 children by taking in to assist their parents to help those children avoid the juvenile justice foster care system. Would you please welcome Mr. Ronald F. C. Our next honoree is affectionately known as the Mayor of Greater Mondawmin. He got the unofficial title because over the years he's taken it upon himself to make sure that Greater Mondawmin was represented whenever an elected official was visiting the community. And he has lived on the Edgemont Avenue, formerly part of the Parkview Community Association, for 60 years. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Nathaniel Freeman. An integral part of the Upper Utah Madison neighborhood community. Despite health challenges, 
He continues his role as president of the association and he works really hard with city officials and agencies to let them know what his community needs. Would you please welcome Mr. Robert Guignard. The Mayfield Improvement Association says its community is fortunate to have this gentleman because of his spirit of volunteerism and his friendly and always there to help personally, a personality and his personality lends itself to all that he does. When his four sons were young, he also served as troop leader for many years and today he still gives generously of his time at school, church and neighborhood functions. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. David Henry. Our next honoree spends a large portion of his day completely immersed in the life and activity of mid Govins community. He wants to make certain it continues to be a safe, beautiful, and green place to live, work, and play. And he is the great father and raised three adopted children as a single parent when his wife suddenly passed away several years ago. You'll find him walking up and down the streets of mid Govins, talking to neighbors and residents about problems and solutions in the community. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Urban Johns. Our next honoree is unfortunately not able to attend. He is out of town, but this is one that I'm familiar with because he and I were classmates at one time. He is the director of the Druid Heights uh, We Can Achieve program, which serves the at-risk youth of ages 16 to 20 years of age and focuses on dysfunctional thinking, gang prevention, and life skills. And I will accept on his behalf, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Adrian Muldrow. <laughs> this gentleman was nominated because he works hard to strengthen families and he stays dedicated to help children in his community. His long day, which begins at 3.30 a.m., I know what that's like so he can commute to work does not stop him from getting home in time to pick up his children and help with homework and serving as president of the Kip Ujima Association at his son's school. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Nicholson. This gentleman's love for his Marble Hill community has not gone unnoticed. He's the past president of the community association and has established a wonderful rapport with residents both young and old, and many of the young men in the, in the neighborhood look up to him and call him Pops. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Atiba Nkrumah. <laughs> Our next honoree has been a strong advocate in the Latino community in Baltimore. Every year, he coordinates an event to celebrate World AIDS Day, and he's an outspoken leader in bringing the topic of HIV to the Latino community. He supported efforts with various Hispanic networks to enhance communication among Latino residents, and he is an amazing leader who needs to be recognized for his mentoring and support for the community around issues of health. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alfredo Santiago. This gentleman has been a father figure in the Charles Village community for many years. For more than a decade, he has served on the Civic Association Board. He uh, single-handedly solicits vendors for the annual Charles Village Festival. A great work is being done right now by Mr. John Spurrier. <laughs> Our next honoree, when it comes to him, it's not what he does, but rather what doesn't he do. He's the eyes, ears, protector, and guardian of the community, and you can find him walking each morning, making sure all is well while picking up trash. He helps with community cleanups, dumpster days, picnics, and gardening days. Ladies and gentlemen, our next honoree, Mr. William Bill St. John. Our next honoree was nominated for the top neighborhood dad honor because he consistently volunteers his time to help out everyone and is truly committed to not only his own family, but also the children at the Mount Washington School. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Sean A. Stinnett. Our next honoree is the leader of the Ukrainian community in the city. I love that cathedral that's down on Eastern Avenue. That thing is awesome. I love it. Um, that thanks to his hard work and dedication and compassion, thousands of Ukrainians were able to make Baltimore their home. Father Savinsky is a great contributor to the spiritual life of the community. Ladies and gentlemen, Reverend Vasil Savinsky. 
Ladies and gentlemen, our next honoree is of the Douglas Somerset Resident Council and their top neighborhood dad. He has never forgotten his community and neighbors whenever he's asked to help, whether it's for the church or an elderly neighbor, he's there, ready, and willing to help out. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kenneth Troy. <laughs> Mr. Troy is not here this afternoon, and we shall, as a matter of fact, we will have uh, a representative come and accept for him. You get two walks today, man, that's pretty good. Did you get two meals? <laughs> He gave me two slices of cake in the bag, you know? Yeah. It's, 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 it's uh, strawberry shortcake, too, real good. Mm. Uh, this next gentleman, of course, is known as a hardworking neighbor in the Lauraville area and in the Lauraville section of the city, always ready to support however he can. He has coached soccer and has been an event organizer of local youth programs for church and for school. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Chris Wall. Our next honoree is a dedicated neighborhood dad in the Southern Park Heights community. He does so much for the youth in the community. He coaches the Park Heights Saints football team for close to 200 neighborhood kids. And when kids don't have transportation to get to and from games and practices, he always picks them up in his van. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Garrick Williams. And last but not least, our last honoree, is the great father figure to many children across the city. Since 2005, he has coached football and lacrosse and an indoor football team comprised of mostly inner city youth. The Gardenville Gators and Middle River Renegades are just a few of the teams that he's inspired. And he's uses uh, the lessons of sports to mold the minds and spirits of youth, the youth that he coaches. Ladies and gentlemen, our honoree, Mr. James Wilson. I want to thank uh, Ms. Uh, Sonia Brown from Councilman Mosby's office. Wave your hand. Thank you very much. And David Brown here from Councilman Stokes' office. Thank you very much. I didn't even see you over there. Oh, I have two, two small tokens for uh, Dr. Ross. If you could come up here, I just want to say thank you so much for sharing with us today. And for our um, comedian slash MC, Mr. Harold Ponte. Thank you. Thank you very much. Enjoy. Thank you very much. I think, are you closing us out or am I closing? You're closing us. Oh, we have one thing, more thing. One more I'm answer. sorry. Madam Mayor, we have one of our honorees who would like to present to you an award and acknowledge your uh, great work and devotion to youth. And that's Aww. Mr. Timothy Bridges, Aww. who has with him a plaque that he would like to present. Madam Mayor, I'm, I'm, I'm so very proud to, of you as the mayor and also as Dr. Sam Ross, that's the boss. Um, I hear all those jokes all the time, but one of the uh, uh, positive youth expressions is a uh, Christian school that's in our community in West Baltimore. And the children at their first King and Queen banquet wanted to honor <laughs> people that were making a difference in Baltimore. And this is a plaque from the Greater Christian Academy. Aww, thank you. On behalf of the children.